for your word. I thank you right now, Lord God. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. You know, we've said that what you're expecting is expecting you, but did you know the expectancy had to be on both sides? God has already prepared some things for us, so he's done his part. Now it's my job to begin to expect, because until I begin to expect, until I begin to smell the miracle, till the desire becomes so strong on the inside of me to go get it, the expectancy is one-sided. And any one-sided expectancy usually doesn't come to pass. I never will forget when I was a little boy. You see, one thing, I'm going to say this, when you're expecting something, you, you kind of peep every once in a while. When you're expecting something, you kind of look out every once in a while. And I say that because I remember when I was a little boy, our whole family, we, you know, my mom and dad and sisters and brothers, we had all gone to my grandmother's house. And it was at night, real late at night at this particular time. And for some reason, I, well, I know what it was. At this time, we were, ex we were expecting my uncle to come home from a trip, from a place. Well, he was in prison. Let me just tell you, he was in prison. And we were, we were expecting him to come home. Every once in a while, you know, and we started expecting during the day. Well, he got later and later. At 8 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. And by this time, everybody, you know, I don't know what the purpose of this was. Everybody would go out on the porch and look down the road. Well, they were expecting him to come home. And because they were expecting him, they did something in the natural to see if he was coming. Now, on the other end, he wasn't expecting to come home. So the expectancy was one-sided. And if we're not careful, we'll have some one-sided expected. God's the only one doing the expected. We're not moving towards our expectancy. We're not doing anything to receive what God has for us. Proverbs chapter 3, did I tell you that? I want to show you just a few scriptures. We're not going to be long. Because you already got what you came for this morning, didn't you? You already got it, didn't you? I'm going to share something with you so you can keep it all during the week. In other words, you remember, I got mine Sunday on the 17th of May. And I want you to know, devil, you ain't going to take it back. And I'm going to use some scripture to back up my confession. Because here, how many of you know? He'll come. He'll whisper in your ear. Now, all he's trying to do is... Take your expectancy. Once he steals your expectancy, then the rest of rest, uh, everything else will kind of follow along. Proverbs chapter 3, let's pick up at verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Now what he's saying is, don't, don't let mercy and truth leave you. In other words, you always make sure you are merciful and you are truthful. A lot of times we want mercy to be, everybody show mercy to us. But what it's saying is you be merciful. So don't let it forsake you. Don't let it escape you. Don't let mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy red neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shall they find, so shall, uh, so shall thou find what? Favor and good understanding. In the sight of who? God and man. If you, it says if you, if you don't forsake, uh, uh, Mercy and truth, you're going to have favor and good understanding. Not just in the sight of God, but in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, all your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll what? Direct your path. That's if you don't let mercy and truth forsake you. So you got to hold on. You got to be merciful. You got to, you, you got to let mercy come out of you. You got to let truth come out of you, irregardless of what you're going through. Because sometimes we'll be going through some things. Sometimes, you know, the enemy will be attacking us. And, uh, and, and we won't be joyful. We won't let mercy go out for someone else. Let's talk about that a little bit more later. You've got to realize that you have to be merciful in order for God to allow mercy, uh, 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 to get favor to come your direction. You want favor with God and man, don't you? 
Matthew chapter 6. Let's turn there real quickly. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to hold on to mercy. Going to be truthful in all my dealings. Because I want favor with God and I want favor with man. Matthew 6, we're going to read verse 24. And then we're going to read verse 33. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. In other words, what he's saying is, when you serve a master, that means you, 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 you got to be obedient to one or the, of, of the other. When you serve somebody, that means you're going to be obedient to them. That means you'll become a slave to that person. So, in other words, you say no man can be a slave to two masters. For either he will what? Hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot. Everybody say cannot. You cannot serve God and money, a mammon. You're going to either hate one and love the other, or you're going to despise one and be drawn to the other. You can't serve them both. This is what I believe the Spirit of God is trying to get us to see. We, we want to hold on. See, because we, 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 we hold on to hold on a little bit of the world, a little bit of the flesh, and we hold on to a little bit of God. And when you mix that stuff up, nothing works out. God has given us, Jesus has given us a principle here. He said you can't serve both. You've got to let one of them go. Let's suppose you, so you just applied to, uh, for college. You were a good student in high school. And you've got two colleges you want to go to. You want to go to Morehouse or Spelman if you're a girl. And you, want, uh, and you want to go to Howard. You apply to both of them. You apply to Howard University and you apply to Morehouse and Spelman. And because you're such a good student, you get accepted by both. And because you are such a good student, both of them are wooing you. Both of them want you. Now you've got to make a decision because you can't go to both. Howard is in Washington, D.C. And, Sp and uh, Spelman and Mohouse is in Atlanta. So you can't go to both. Everybody said, i got to make a decision. And what ends up happening, if you're not careful, you have to pray, even though this is a natural decision, you got to pray, Lord, which one do you want me to go to? I want to go to both of them. Both of them are good. But which one, where is my destiny? Which one is the oven for my miracle? Both of them are ovens. But which one has my miracle? Mo House may have Elder Burnell's miracle, but it doesn't have mine. And so, because Elder Burnell can get his miracle from Mo House, I may need to go to Howard. And I have to seek the face of God to find out which one is the oven for my miracle. And it works that way in every area in life. Your miracle is in the oven, but you have to seek the face of God. And you know, if you're not careful, Elder Burnell's miracles smell just as good as yours. If all you go by is smell. But you see, somebody, you know, I'm not going to give you my miracle because it's mine. Everybody say it's mine. I'll have that mercy for you. I'll have compassion for you. But just like those five versions, you got to go get your own. The miracle power of God, and I need you to see this, because if you're not careful, you'll miss your miracle that's in the oven. You can't serve two masters. You're going to hate one and despise the other one. Turn to Mark chapter 5. I like, you know, that song said, God goes beyond our wildest dreams. I say, what? I can dream wild. But God goes beyond my wildest dreams. That sounds like he's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all I could ask or think. Miracles. This is our season. Just like that sign hanging out the bread house, you got to stop today. You can eat all you want today, but tomorrow it may not be here. The opportunity may not be presented tomorrow. So stand right now. Come in today and get your miracle. You know, sometimes we can be too busy. On the way to work to get the, and, and here you, you, you're hungry, and you still won't stop and get your miracle. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Don't compromise on your miracle now before you get it. 
Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And when Jesus, what happened is Jesus had gone over to uh, uh, Gadaria, to the, the island of Gadarene, and ca cast demons out of this man. And, uh, and he was on his way back. He told the man, so you stay here and tell the people what God has done for you. And in verse 21, it says that when Jesus was passed over again by ship and to the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue. That's like a pastor or a priest or something. He's a, he's a ruler of the synagogue, a ruler of the church. His name was Jairus. And when he saw him, Jesus, he fell at his feet. And, and Matthew said he worshipped him. So Jairus falls at Jesus' feet and worshipped him. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hand on her, that she may be what? Healed. And she shall live. That was Jairus' confession. Jesus went with him. At that statement, when Jesus decided to go with Jairus, what he did was he put Jairus' miracle in the oven. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, that act by Jesus, the term uh, sparked Jairus' faith to the point was, oh, he's going with me. So I can, because he said, if you just come and lay your hands on her, she'll live. So Jesus said, okay, I'm going. And he begins to go. On your way to your miracle, just because it's in the oven, you still have to be careful how you react. On his way, now Jesus and Jairus are just going, going to his daughter, 12 years old, young girl. On the way to the miracle, here comes this lady, this woman with the issue of blood. Now, here, Jairus, now Jairus, remember now, he's a ruler of the synagogue. And this lady had no business being out in public. And Jairus, being a ruler of the synagogue, he had the right to stone her. Say, Don't you, what you doing out here? Don't you know I'm a ruler of the synagogue? And you out here with this issue of blood? You shouldn't even be out here in public. He had the right to say that. So he's going to his miracle. It's in the oven because Jesus put it there, gave him the faith because he started going with him. All of a sudden, now this woman stops him. If, if, if we're not careful, we'll be able to say, oh, wait, Jesus, don't come back to her. My miracle, my daughter is almost, did you hear I said she was almost dead? Don't minister right now. Come back to her. Now, what happened is the miracle was in the oven. But Jairus had to be careful that he didn't take it out prematurely. He had to be careful that he allowed that mercy and that compassion that we read about earlier to not interrupt his miracle. He didn't say a word. He, he, he allowed Jesus to minister to this woman with the issue of blood. Heal this woman with the issue of blood. Now, when, he finished, when Jesus finished healing the woman with the issue of blood, drop down to verse 34. 5 and 34 says, And he said unto her, Daughter, this is what Jesus said to the woman with the issue of blood. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Oh, your daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? In other words, you might as well leave him alone. She's dead. Sometimes our miracles we think are dead. And we think there's no hope. God can't resurrect it. But verse 36, as soon, everybody say as soon, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, just believe. In other words, continue to believe. Remember, I put it in the oven when I told you I was coming. It's not the circumstances that's going to cause that, that, that miracle to be hindered. It's not what you go through uh, from the time you put it in the oven until the time you get it out. It's not what you go through. That's going to hinder that miracle. It's the fact that you stop. It's the fact that you allow doubt and unbelief to hinder you from continue pressing toward your miracle. Jesus said, as soon as he heard it, what did he say? Be not afraid, only believe. 
But it was saying, continue to believe. And that's what the Spirit of God is telling you. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how difficult it seems. Just don't be afraid. During this week, you received your miracle, and you were excited. Around this excitement, you know, everybody was excited. Everybody was jumping, and everybody was hollering. You were believing God for your miracle. You were believing God for your money. You were believing God for uh, 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 relationships being restored, believing God to do some supernatural things in your life. But when you get out, the devil comes and says, oh, it's dead now. You've, been, you've waited too long. Be got to be just like Jesus. No, I'm going to stand. He looked and said, nope. He didn't say this, but he might as well. He said, that's from the devil. Don't fear. Just what? Believe. Just believe. Everybody say, I believe. Now, what, another, uh, another thing, that's a way, another way of saying, just continue to believe. You believe when I told you, when I put it in the oven, and you start smelling it. But what happened is, you, you became distracted. Now, now, another thing, too, you say so you still believed while I ministered to this lady. You didn't disrupt me. You weren't impatient. You allowed mercy to flow because you allowed me to minister to this woman with the issue of blood. Your daughter, by the way, his daughter was 12 years old, and this woman had been afflicted for 12 years. Isn't that something? 12 years she had been afflicted. But Jesus said, only believe. Everybody say, only believe. So end up, ends, ends up going on. You know the story. Jesus uh, lays his hands on the uh, young, young girl and she's healed. One other thing that hindered it, could have hindered it, after he got to the house where uh, Jairus' daughter was, all the ladies were around weeping and wailing, the Bible says, because they knew she was what? Dead. Jesus walks up. Now, you could imagine, here Jairus is coming along, and all of a sudden now, he see all this turmoil around the house. He see all this weeping and wailing. Jesus said, Oh, she's not dead. She's just asleep. Now, when you start speaking that kind of stuff, they're going to do you just like they did Jesus. They're going to laugh him to scorn. They begin to laugh Jesus to scorn. But what you got to do, you got to put them out. You're going to have to get from around people that don't understand where you're going. You're going to have to, even if it's your family, sometimes you're not going to be able to tell people what God has told you. you you're just not going to be able to share some things because they are not going to understand. And when, they, when you do share it and they begin to ridicule, you got to put them out. Put them out your life. Put them out your business. Put them out. And you got, uh, you got to begin to stand on what God has told you because only God has put that thing down on the inside of you. Only God has braced that thing down on the inside of you. People just don't want to understand. Now, they don't, you know what? They don't mean any harm because they are looking at the natural. They are looking at, yeah, this girl's heart has stopped beating and she's quit breathing. She's dead. And all of a sudden, Jesus said, oh, no, she's not dead. She's just asleep. Now, notice what Jesus did, does after this. He takes Peter, James, and John, and the mother and the father. Those are the only people he took in the room with the girl. Everybody else was laughing. Everybody else went operating in faith. He said, we got to get this out the oven. This is a miracle that's in the oven, and we can't leave it here no longer. But I'm going to take the people that realize the miracle is ready to come out. Because there are other people that don't realize that the miracle is ready and they'll continue to laugh. Did you know people can distract you? If you, if you, if, if you keep doubters and unbeliefs around you, they'll begin to distract you. They'll begin to hinder the miracle that you need to receive. You can know your miracles in your oven. I just told you. And the Bible, you know, the word of God says, not one word of Samuel fell to the ground. Not one of my words will fall to the ground. All you have to do is just grab hold to it and receive it. And say, Lord, I receive that miracle. I receive that word. And the power of God will begin to manifest. Don't allow, don't allow the, the scorners, don't allow the weepers and the wailers to distract you from your miracle. Go to the oven. It's ready. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Turn to uh, John chapter 9. Mm, thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. John chapter 9, let's pick it up in verse 1. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going to hit this real quick. We talked a little bit about this last time. As John chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth, from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What well, Jesus answered, neither one of them sinned. 
Then in verse 5 it says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the what? Light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spit on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said to him, go wash. Where? In the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sin. And he went away, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Let's suppose now on his way from where he was to the pool of Siloam, let's suppose he had to pass his house. He could have found water anywhere to wash off the mud. But where did Jesus tell him to go? To the pool of Siloam. Now, it, so it, <laughs> it wasn't the water that washed off the mud. It was obedience. Now, sometimes what we'll do, we'll short, short circuit what God has told us. And we'll try to figure out, well, he got the mud on my eyes and he told me to go wash. He really, as long as I get the mud off, it doesn't matter. That's what you're, that's what you're real reasoning. Well, it's not the fact that the water washed off the mud. It's the fact that obedience was it. It's the fact that he was obedient. So he walked to the pool of Siloam. Now, he's blind. Had many opportunities and had his friends say, man, why are you going where to Siloam? Here's a bowl of water right here. Wash that mud off your eyes right here. And, you know, sometimes we can get distracted. We'll start short-circuiting what God has told us to do. And let me tell you what we'll do. We'll say, okay, you know you're right. Give me that water. And we'll take it and we wash it off. And still can't see. Wash it off. Now, this is what we're going to do. Well, let me go back to Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I, I used the water, but it didn't. He said, well, I told you what to do. I told you to go to the pool of what? Siloam. I didn't tell you to go by your neighbor's house. Because your neighbor don't know who put the mud on there. Don't know why it was put there. And that's what ends up happening. We start rationalizing and we start reasoning what God has told us. Oh, Jesus, we can't do that because the pool of Siloam is where the obedience is. And that's why we're receiving the miracles today. Because when the word came forth for us to shout, we shouted and we danced and we received. Now, the testimony is going to come in a few minutes, a few days, a few hours when we start testifying about the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm obedient. That's all I had to do. See, once I got to, once the man got to Siloam, it was done. Once he washed the, with the water from Siloam, it was done. So once I did what I knew to do, it was done. I had done what the Holy Spirit told me to do. He had done what Jesus told him to do. Everybody say it's done. It's done every way. It's done from being in the oven, and it's done because you finished. It's done. The oven has done its work. Just go get your miracle. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's read Acts. Acts chapter 23. No, we're not going to read it. Acts chapter 23, read this, uh, in Acts 23 and 27. In Acts chapter 23, probably around somewhere around verse 11, and then Acts 27, just write it down. I'm going to show you what happened. We're going to talk about this. In Acts 23, 11, Jesus told Paul, he said, look, Paul, they were persecuting him because of, of his stand for Christ. And Jesus said, Paul, you're going to have to go to Rome. You need to preach this gospel in Rome. When he told, when the Holy Spirit told Paul that. What happened? He put the miracle in the oven. That meant that all he had to do now was continue his march because he had to show up in Rome because the Holy Spirit had told him he's going to be in Rome. So Paul began to walk towards that destination. Well, in verse 27, he got on this ship, headed to Rome. All of a sudden now, they, into, they get into this uh, great hurricane, as they call it, Eurocana. And all of a sudden now, they begin to th uh, throw stuff off the ship. They begin to do everything in the natural to save their lives. Now, remember, they're going to Rome. The Holy Spirit has spoken to them and said, you got to preach this gospel in Rome. But 
in I think verse 23, 27 and 23, Scripture says, all hope, everybody say all hope, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. In other words, it looked like all of us were going to go down doomed. But the Bible says Paul took, uh, withdrew himself and an angel came and spoke to him and said, yeah, remember what God said to you that you had to show up in Rome? Say, you're going to show up in Rome. Then he said, but God's going to give you everybody with you. He's going to give you all these people. They're going to be saved too. They got saved. They got delivered because of the promise that was made to Paul. There are going to be people that's going to get saved and delivered because of the promise that was made to you. All your relatives and your friends, they're going, to get, they're going to latch on to your promises because what God has promised you. That's why you can't be, you can't take this lightly because when you refuse to receive your miracle, somebody else suffers. Somebody else may suffer. God wants to do some supernatural things in your life. And I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are in life. There's absolutely nothing too hard for God. I don't care how much money you need. I don't care how sick you are in your body. I don't, there's nothing too hard for God. Your miracle is in the oven, and you're going to get it. I want you to stand on your feet. God has done some supernatural things today. And these scriptures, I want you to use them as warfare scriptures. I want you to use them to do warfare with the enemy. I want you to remember what the Spirit of God said to Jairus and Paul. And I want you to begin to say, I'm going to stand for my miracle. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be sidetracked. I realized that when Jesus spoke it, it was put in the oven. I realized when the word said it, it was put in the oven. There are a lot of things that will be put in the oven that's going to burn up because we are not staying course. Sometimes we get stuff out prematurely because we get too impatient. Can everybody say, let's wait on God. Say it again, just wait on God. You see, you can't get impatient. Because there's probably nothing worse.